Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this new week, this new morning, and the opportunity to once again uh, study the past, uh, the past leading of your Holy Spirit, of this movement. And um, we ask, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can once again speak to our hearts and guide and direct us and continue to lead us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you can um, not remove the difficulties around us, but that you can give us strength and, and light uh, to see clearly. And we know, Lord, that the light of the past is to guide us. We pray for this study. Uh, completing the study of Gideon and um, at least as part as Jeff's part of Gideon's torch. And we just ask that uh, this message will hit, hit home uh, to each one of us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So Thursday, morning, we had completed uh, the study of Gideon's Torch, Jeff's study, but that was his presentations that he had done in 1999 from the notes that we have in notebook two. And in notebook two, there is a part six. So that's what we're going to uh, look at here today. And so we can actually finish this. And why is this not working out? There we go. Oh, this is best I can do, I guess. <clears throat> so this part six, wandering in the wilderness, I guess Jeff probably in his presentations only got through part five. He didn't have enough time to get through this part. Um, so we're gonna read through this. A lot of this is things that we've read before. So some things we might just skim through a bit. Um, so the title of this part is part six, Wandering in the Wilderness. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts and the work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen, the few who, following in the providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding the warning to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth, and in turn, the labor of its advocates was necessarily spent in answering these opponents and defending the truth. Thus, the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Advent body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, a holy, ha healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. Now, <clears throat> there's lots here in what we've already read. So if we're going to make a parallel with October 22nd, 1844, and July 18, 2020, what is this passage saying to us?
Isn't this a condemnation of us? Yeah. You know, and, you know, I, and I've been focusing upon the fact that each of us individually need to examine our own hearts. So, you know, so that was what was supposed to happen in 1844. And some people did. Some people were willing to receive the light. But there's a condemnation. And can we say that it's true today, as it was then, that dissensions and divisions came in? The majority opposed with voice and pen the few who, following in the province of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Why wouldn't it be true? Yeah. So it is true, you know. Now, you know, I'm going to be just very, very blunt about this in, in trying to, to understand what is happening. Now, now yesterday, between, between the presentations, there was a discussion dealing with uh, the COVID um, vaccine and, and the pandemic and all these types of things. Now, in listening to that, I saw a view that I believe to be in error. That is, I don't believe that it's correct to say that taking the vaccine at this time is the testing message. There are many people who are in a position where they don't have the light that we have, and it's not because they're in rebellion. It's not a clear cut issue. For us it is, you know, who know, but many people who are Seventh-day Adventists don't have the same influence, don't have the same information that we have. And my view is that you can't say that somebody is now going through a test that if they took the vaccine, then that means that they are, they would then be lost if we're gonna take that position. If we believe that this is part of the test of the Sunday law, that it's this progressive test. And we do believe there is a progressive test. Now, when it comes to the health message, we know what the health message is. It's very clear in the spirit of prophecy. And somebody may be following the health message in every particular that they understand, but they may feel, based upon the information that they have, that they should take a vaccine. Now, they would be wrong, I believe, in thinking that that's a sound uh, uh, you know, position to take. I don't think it's, it's wise, but they may have reasons why they believe that's the case. And I don't think it's something clear in the world, in Adventism, of you know, that the vaccine is bad and, you know, uh, that somehow that somebody who takes the vaccine is, is making that kind of decision that's salvational in that aspect. Sure, I believe the vaccine's wrong. I wouldn't take it myself. Um, I did post on uh, the, the WhatsApp group, the Call to Unity group, I did post a link uh, to a guy named Danny Goki, who opposes vaccine mandates. Um, now, this is not an Adventist, but he says that this is a birthing point for the mark of the beast. So he at least understands that this force of trying to get people to take a vaccine is, is wrong. Now, he himself is vaccinated, so he doesn't see that the vaccine itself is wrong, even though he knows other people think it is. But this is the point that I've been making this whole time is that this is a preparation for the Sunday law in that the governments are, are manipulating us, that the media is manipulating us in the same way that it's gonna manipulate us and manipulate people in the time of the Sunday law. So we know that this pandemic, the actions that are taking shows that it's a type of the Sunday law, but it's not the Sunday law itself it is not a test. That's my view. Now, I could be wrong, but that's not really the issue of whether I'm right or wrong. The issue of is how are we going about addressing this message 
in a, a discussion. So I don't know how many people were there. Do you think there was a willingness to discuss this point? Since I was there. Yeah. I would have to say that there was an there was a, a barrier. Okay. I don't I don't see this as, as being a willingness to discuss the point. It's almost as if one side has a very entrenched opinion and they were unwilling to to listen or even give thought to the other side. Okay. And that's that to me is the issue. Whether I'm right or wrong is not the issue. Correct? I, I'm not going to disagree with you on that at all. Yeah. The the situation that, that bothers me. Uh -huh. In in this conversation, what I was observing was others wanted to talk over. Now, I'm not speaking you, but there were others that, that when you would start to say something, they wanted to interrupt, they wanted to talk over, they wanted their opinion heard. Mm -hmm. Now, it's unlike much of, of what I've seen, but it bothers me because it's showing a lack of patience. It's showing a lack of respect for the other person. Right. Yeah, because for me, what I see is that there is fear on both sides of this issue. Of course. And, and I don't think that that's healthy for us to be in fear. Because we can talk about the fear of the world out there, but we need to realize we have the same types of fears and emotions motivating us. And when it comes to these dissensions and divisions, um, when I see this dissension and division that exists in this movement right now, that's the thing that bothers me. One is, I believe that everybody should always be able to express what they think without being ostracized. Unless they're, they're doing something that's, you know, obviously against the Bible. Um, and, and, and being very aggressive and all those types of things, then, you know, then there comes a point where that happens. But when you have a brother who differs on some opinion, we need to follow the counsel that Ellen White gives. And that is we need to take time to listen to one another. And I've spent a lot of time listening to other people's positions. And, and, and it's fine, I have no problem with them holding a difference of opinion. But the fact that I can't express my views because they differ and that I'm basically ostracized and cut out, that to me is what Ellen White's talking about. Now, I can be just as divisive. So I need to recognize that. So I need to see what it is that I'm doing that has caused this? Is there something in my character? Is there something in my understanding? Because I don't really have control over what other people are doing. Uh, the problem that we have when we have dissensions and divisions is that people entrench themselves in their position, but they also tend to justify attitudes and actions uh, that they are taking, which they should not be justifying. So I can't justify anything that I've done. Um, God is the one who has to, to prove that work, whether it's of him or not. So we shouldn't be in a position where we have to, to fight. We should be in a position where we're willing to listen uh, to one another, even to listen to those who have a views that we don't agree with, that that we believe to be wrong and, and that may be wrong. So, so this is the thing that has troubled me presently. It's not so much the divisions in the past because there's nothing we can do about those. Those are gone. But this movement is being called right now to address 
the divisions and dissensions that exist now. And I don't personally know what to do about it other than to continue to do what I do, do what I'm doing and say what I'm saying in regard to the past. If we bring the past before us and we look at the past, maybe we can learn the lessons of the past. That, that's my view. And when we th think about devoting our time and talents to the one purpose of, of sounding a warning to the world. Now, one of the things, do we even know what that warning is? Are we agreed upon what that warning is? Um, are we united in giving that warning? Can we even become united in giving that warning? You know, that's the question that I have. So I see, you know, right now we have this dissension. It seemed to me pretty obvious uh, on Sabbath. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to address this? How are we going to fix this problem? That's, you know, the thing that I look at. And I don't have the answer to that, really. Other than what I've been giving is that individually we need to examine our own hearts. But I don't want to see a division occur again in this movement, like what we had on De December 6, 2020. And I'm not ever going to take an action in any way to cause a division. You know, my, my goals, everything that I'm doing is to try to unite this movement. And, and of course, I can't do anything for anyone else. I can only make sure that my life is in line and, and trust that God is going to be working in other people's lives to bring about uh, this change that needs to happen so that this movement can be working in one accord with a clear message and, and, and accomplishing what it is God wants us to accomplish. So I'm not calling for a type of unity that's organizational in, in, the, in the human sense. And, and I don't think that that's what Ellen White is talking about. If you read here, in a sense, one of the reasons that organization had to occur was the fact that there would have been no other way with so many voices wanting to be heard that any work could have been accomplished. It would have been just James and Ellen White publishing the present truth with a few friends, uh, supporting them financially. Um, and, and so, but as time went on, the only way that Adventism could get a foothold in the world as far as giving a message that was gonna be worldwide was for us to organize. And, but that shouldn't have happened. The Adventist church should never have gotten to that point where it had to become the Seventh-day Adventist official denomination. But it became that because of their wandering in the wilderness. Okay. <clears throat> Just as the Israelites should have gone immediately to Canaan and not wandered for 40 years. So for 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow many years. Um, so Jeff then is going to quote from Judges 8, 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So this is the part that Jeff didn't address in his presentations on Gideon's torch. And you can see um, the timeliness of us looking at this. The people of Israel, filled with joy and gratitude at their deliverance from the Midianites, 
proposed to Gideon that he should become their king and that the throne should be confirmed to his descendants. His answer shows how true and noble were the motives by which he was actuated. I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. At the divine command, Gideon had willingly gone forth to battle for Israel. He had not shrunk from duty nor hesitated in the face of danger, but he nobly refused to accept from the people those honors which the Lord had reserved to himself the right to bestow. God had manifested special favor to Gideon in selecting him as the instrument through whom to deliver Israel. While great responsibilities rested upon him in this important crisis, Gideon's course was marked with humility and faithful obedience. God accepted his work and crowned his efforts with success. But now Gideon was assailed by temptation in a new form. When the reprover of wrong has done his work in obedience to God's commands. The period of inactivity which which succeeds the struggle is often the most dangerous. This danger Gideon now experienced. A spirit of unrest was upon him. Hitherto, he had been content to execute the commands given him of God, but now, instead of calmly waiting for divine instruction, he began to devise and execute plans for himself. He had not learned to wait as well as to labor, to suffer God's will, as well as to do it. So what is uh, Ellen White saying here about what has happened to Gideon? What is Gideon doing? He becomes impatient. Becomes impatient. Now, why does that happen? As humans, we always seek activity rather than taking the time to reflect and understand what God is trying to tell us. Right. So, so we know that, that God's work is going to be accomplished. And we studied this a little bit in the afternoon, dealing with uh, patience, what it is. I mean, it's, it's knowing what it is we have to do and to do that in spite of what we see happening around us. Now, so Gideon had this, uh, he sailed by a temptation in a new form, this period of inactivity, which succeeds the struggle. So uh, is often the most dangerous, right? As Ellen White says. So what's going to happen here? Um, she says, no impatient man or woman will ever enter into the courts of heaven. We must not allow the natural feelings to control our judgment. So when she talks about impatience, Um, you know, we just think about it as waiting, right? You know, we don't want to wait, but it's it's more than that. It has to do with the emotions, Um, not just the emotions of, of, um, of waiting, whatever that is in patience in that sense, but all of the natural feelings that we have that start to make us uh, to start to control our actions they affect our judgment, the decisions that we make. You know, and this for me has been, you know, the difficult thing in my life. I, like I'm naturally a very patient person, but my patience is always the thing that's the most tested in that around us, things appear not to be happening in the way that we would want them to happen. And so we have to wait upon God. And, you know, in a sense, you know, for me personally, that waiting has gone on for, you know, decades to see what I believe that God wants to accomplish. And, and, and so we're in this situation where you see people acting in a certain way and you think, is it ever going to change? I mean, it, it's kind of similar to what happened with Elijah, you know, where God had to say there's 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed the knee unto Baal. So can we trust that God is going to accomplish this work in spite of what we see? We can. Yeah. Always. Right. So, so we need to trust him now. So, so on the one hand, I present this, this problem, you know, this dissension, and I don't think that we should ignore it, but the, 
but the solutions that we have are extremely important. You know, because what often will happen is man will step in, and this is what happened, you know, not to just put all the blame on, th on them, but December 6th, um, that was a rash act, was it not? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. There was so much impatience as far as we need to resolve this now. And, and in doing that, there was no willingness to really listen. What is the answer? Man acted and basically cut themselves off from this message of life. They rejected all that had happened in the past. And, and that's one kind of manifestation of what impatience does. But we could do the same thing, just in a different way. Even supporting July 18th, we can be just as impatient, just as rash, just as, as filled with emotion, which is something we can't afford to do. And, you know, in my evaluation, now, yesterday, when I, when I said what I said, I wanted to, I was actually testing which maybe isn't a nice thing to do. But I wanted to see if I put forward my opinion, what kind of response I would get. And I got the response I did not want. And that was a closed mind. And, and I'm not trying to put myself there in justifying either what I did or that I'm somehow better than the other person. But what I am saying is that I was testing the waters to see is there any openness to discuss this issue? And I don't believe that there is. And I don't believe that's a good thing. But as far as the solution, I don't think the solution is something that, that comes from any one person. We need to understand the past and we have to somehow be able to communicate this to everyone in this movement I'm probably not necessarily the person to do that. We need to rec recognize that this movement right now is filled with emotion because of what's happening around us in the world. Um, Ellen White, so that was from Review and Herald, February 21st, 1888. Now this is from Signs of the Times, February 10th, 1909. Life is disciplinary. While in the world, the Christian will meet with adverse influences. There will be provocations to test the temper. And it is by meeting these in a right spirit that the Christian graces are developed. The standard is high to which we must attain if we would be children of God, pure, holy, and undefiled. But how could we reach this standard if there were no difficulties to meet, no obstacles to surmount, nothing to develop patience and endurance. Trials are not the smallest blessings that come to us. They are designed to nerve us to determination to succeed. Instead of allowing them to hinder, oppress, and destroy us, we are to use them as God's means of enabling us to gain the victory over self. That's what this whole movement is about. And you can see that Jeff understood this back in 1999, whether he understood all of that was going to happen, obviously not. But he understood that this was about a manifestation of Christ's character and that all of the difficulties that we would have, and, and maybe he would see this often as from outside, not so much as from within the movement. Of course, he never really understood the movement as such. But you know, he couldn't have foreseen all this, but he understood the principles. The gospel of Christ is truly believed only when it is practiced. Faith is justified by works. Self must be hid. Christ must appear as the chiefest among 10,000, the one altogether lovely. When an unreserved surrender of the powers of the whole being is made to the Savior, self no longer strives for the mastery. What man needs today is the crucifixion of self and the revelation of his life of Christ, the hope of glory. Then will be fulfilled the words, ye are the light of the world. Signs of the Times, July 26, 1905. So you can see 
this revelation of the life of Christ. We, we all know that we need to have a re revelation of Christ, but we also need to become a revelation of Christ. Little annoyances and trials born with patience will fit the soul for the endurance of greater trials and more severe tests. But proportionate grace will be given for every trial that shall come upon us. Review and Herald, May 19th, 1896. So now Jeff's going to look at Judges 8, 24 to 29, dealing with the, build, the making of this ephod. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spared a garment, spread a garment and did cast there in every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Beside ornaments and collars and purple, purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camels necks. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Oprah. And all Israel went thither, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. And Jerob Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Um, Ellen White says, it was not customary for the Levites to enter upon their peculiar services until they were 25 years of age. But Samuel had been an exception to this rule. Every year, he saw more important trusts committed to him. And while he was yet a child, a linen ephod was placed upon him as a token of his consecration of the work of the sanctuary. So Jeff here is going to focus upon the ephod as this uh, priestly garment. Over the ephod, and that was from Patriarchs and Prophets 7, 574, and this next one's from page 351. Over the ephod was the breastplate, the most sacred of the priestly vestments. This was of the same material as the ephod. It was in the form of a square measuring a span and was suspended from the shoulders by a cord of blue from golden rings. The border was formed of a variety of precious stones, the same that formed the 12 foundations of the city of God. Within the border were 12 stones set in gold arranged in rows of four. And like those in the shoulder pieces engraved with the names of the tribes, uh, the Lord's direction was, Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually, Exodus 28, 29. So Christ, the great high priest, pleading his blood before the Father in the sinner's behalf, bears upon his heart the name of every repentant believing soul, says the psalmist. I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me, Psalm 40, verse 17. Um, Christ's redeemed ones are his jewels, his precious and peculiar treasure. They shall be as the stones of a crown, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, Zechariah 9, 16, Ephesians 1, 18. In them he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Christ looks upon his people in their purity and perfection as the reward of all his sufferings, his humiliation, and his love, and the supplement of his glory. Christ, the great center from whom radiates all glory. And that's from That I May Know Him, page 369. Christ, or, or God had placed his people in Canaan as a mighty breastwork to the tide um, of moral evil that it might not flood the world to stay the tide uh to stay the tide pardon me uh of moral evil that it might not flood the world if faithful to him god intended that israel should go on conquering and to conquer he would give their hands into their hands nations greater and more powerful than the canaanites the promise was if ye shall diligently keep all my all these commandments which i command you then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river 
the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay fear, the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Deuteronomy 11, 22 to 25, and that's from Patriarchs and Prophets 544. Gideon led the people to look upon this ephod and breastplate as possessing special sacredness in themselves. In this he erred. All that could make them sacred was the fact that they were employed in the solemn service of God as he directed. The high priest alone was authorized to wear them when he went in before the Lord. So the position I took that this was maybe a civil ephod, um, Ellen White seems to be implying here that this was used in some sort of uh, priestly way. Uh, is, is that how you read this? That's definitely how I read yeah. it. Okay. Now, um, the Lord has often made manifest in his providence that nothing less than revealed truth, the word of God, can reclaim man from sin or keep him from transgression. That word which reveals the guilt of sin has a power upon the human heart to make man right and keep him so. The Lord has said that his word is to be studied and obeyed. It is to be brought into the practical life, but the word is as inflexible as the character of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so there's a bunch of things here uh, that I'm going to just kind of skip. Uh, this one here, the ephod and breastplate were regarded with pride because of their costly material and exquisite workmanship, and after a time, were looked upon with superstitious reverence. So again, this would be um, talking about the ephod of, of Gideon. Okay, so as a question. It's the same, it's the same uh, uh, article, Signs of the Times, July 28th, 1881. Yeah. Okay. I have some questions too. <laughs> okay. Would you see that Gideon was looking upon this when he, he constructs this ephod and breastplate that he had been appointed as a priest, that when he offered the the sacrifice upon the rock that God was appointing him as a priest? I don't know if I would see that because uh, because she says it's going to be worn by the high priest. Isn't that what she's saying? Well, of course she's saying that. Right. So, um, you know, so the question that I have actually more, more directly is, is where is this being worn? Um, we know that there's the, the, the temple, or, you know, there isn't the temple yet. There's just the tabernacle. Um, but this ephod is going to be kept in Oprah, right? So in, in the city there of, of Gideon. Uh, so how is it being used? It, you know, uh, um, good question. <laughs> seems to me so, it's more like a memorial. Yeah, so. Well. <clears throat> so it, there's some details missing here that, it, you know, I, my imagination can fill in, but I, I could be wrong. Okay, go on, Dwight. In, in some of this, okay. <clears throat> as, as this last paragraph reads, Gideon led the people to look upon this ephod and the breastplate as possessing special sacredness in themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, if we looked at a story that comes up much later, the sons of Eli believed that the Ark of the Covenant mm -hmm. had special sacred Set, had special sacredness in itself right and that's that's the way that the philistines treated it as well that this was the god of israel mm -hmm. so as as that paragraph continued in this gideon erred 
Yeah. All that could make this sacred was the fact that they were employed in the solemn service of God as he had directed. So the ephod that was in Shiloh. Yeah. Could only be sacred as long as it was employed as God had instructed. The high priest alone was authorized to wear them when he went in before the Lord. So this ephod that Gideon constructed was not being worn before the Lord. It was not going in to the holy place. It was definitely not going into the most holy place. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think from my reading of this, it doesn't seem that it's being used in the sacred service, but what service is it being used in? That's the question that we don't have an answer to. Well, the way that the way that this looks is that this ephod was constructed only as a symbol, but yeah. it was also a snare for the people where they lived. Right. So they have this symbol that's like the ephod that the high priest wears, but it's not being employed, but it starts to be looked upon as a sacred object. Okay. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be like the... Um, the brazen serpent that Moses made, and afterwards they started to worship it. Yeah. Well, my question goes to a little bit more modern situation. Okay. What if if this ephod is similar to what Parmender and Tess have been presenting as uh, necessary to understand the parables? Okay, well, I guess we could apply it in that way. I mean, I, I'm trying to bring it a bit more closer to home. Okay. So when we look at, at, at the parallel between Gideon and this movement, the question is, what is it that we have done of what God has given us? What is it that we have have um misapplied and, and this to me is in the context of this rashness so when i look at december 6th uh, 2020 for instance um and i and i look at this ephod as a symbol what it symbol symbolizes it, it does symbolize spiritual leadership does it not very directly yeah and the taking up of this ephod, this making of this ephod is a false organization. So you could apply it to Parminder and Tess. I wouldn't necessarily say with the parables, I would say with the organization that they were creating. But to me, it's more closer to home to what happened on December 6th, that there was this ephod made, which was you know, you could say it was that declaration on December 6th or something, something to do with that organization that was made. And, and that, you know, the idea of it having sacredness in and of itself, they believed that because they were the leadership of FFA, that they then, they then were holy. But it's only holy when it's employed properly. Leadership only has a role when it is done according to God's will. Nobody can say, because I'm a leader, I then have the authority to make whatever decision I see fit and that everybody must follow it. Does that seem apt or am I off base? That's a good it's application. At this point. Okay. You know, and, and I think that's the one thing that we can't afford to do in this movement at this time is to build an ephod. You know, and, and I keep stressing this, that, that we can't organize, and which seems almost contrary to what, you know, the message was prior to July 18th, especially going back to 2017, you know, that we needed to have organization. And I believe that we did have organization, that God was our leader in 2017. I believe specifically that God took this movement, uh, took the reins of this movement into his own hands. 
And we need to follow God because he's the one in charge of this movement still. Um, so this next paragraph here, uh, a religion of externals is attractive to the unrenewed heart. The pomp and ceremony of the Catholic worship have a seductive, bewitching power by which many are deceived. And they come to look upon the Roman church as the very gate of heaven. Now, of course, this is talking about Catholicism, but it can apply to any organization. There is a bewitching power that authority has. None are proof against her influence, but those who have planted their feet firmly upon the foundation of truth and whose hearts are renewed by the spirit of God. Thousands who have not an experimental knowledge of Christ will be swept away or be swept into this deception. And this is true, not just of the Catholic church, but of any type of deception where we are not planted, we don't have our feet planted firmly upon the foundation of truth. And this movement right now, we're examining the foundation we have to know that that foundation is solid, that we have to plant our feet firmly upon it. Um, so Ellen White says in this next statement in Great Controversy 567, in the second paragraph here, there's a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of the first advent of Christ, or Christ's first advent. So when we... We think about this similarity. What is this similarity? They were trying to obtain salvation by what they thought were good works. It was all formal and dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a profession to believe the law, right? that the Jews had, and the Romans claim to reverence the cross, they exalt the symbol of Christ's sufferings, while in their lives they deny him whom it represents. And that is the danger that exists. We know that there is truth, but the question is, are we going to let that truth affect us? Is it going to change us? Because we can make a profession of the truth, but if we act like the world, that profession of truth doesn't mean anything. And the thing is, we can fool ourselves that we're not like the world. How do we fool ourselves that we're not like the world when we're like the world? We can have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God, correct? We need to talk ourselves into anything. How often in our day is the love of pleasure disguised by a form of godliness, a religion that permits men while observing the rites of worship to devote themselves to selfish or sensual gratification is as pleasing to the multitudes now as in the days of Israel. And there are still pliant errands who, while holding positions of authority in the church, will yield to the desires of the unconsecrated and thus encourage them in sin. Now, Ellen White's dealing with this, these types of things here, where you have a church that observes all kinds of things, but, but still is just in the world. But we can see this also in the same sort of attitudes that the world has, political positioning, maneuvering. None of these things have any place in the church. Um, this from Patriarchs and Prophets 547. Gideon's father, Joash, who shared in the apostasy of his countrymen, had erected at Ophrah, where he dwelt, a large altar to Baal, at which the people of the town worshipped. Gideon was commanded to destroy this altar and to erect an altar to Jehovah over the rock on which the offering had been consumed, and there to present a sacrifice to the Lord. The offering of sacrifice to God had been committed to the priests, and had been restricted to the altar at Shiloh, but he who had established the ritual service and to whom all its offerings pointed had power to change its requirements. The deliverance of Israel was to be preceded by a solemn protest against the worship of Baal. Gideon must declare war upon idolatry before going out to battle with the enemies of his people. 
So we, we already went through this, understanding that there's this work of reform that is going to precede this message. And, and Jeff began that work of reform in our time. Uh, he, is, he has so fully established the idol self in the heart and worshiped at its shrine, sh shrine, there has been no room for Jesus, no room for light, for love, for meekness and lowliness of heart. Self is magnified into wonderful proportions. His only hope is to die to self, crucify self. If not, he loses that life which measures with the life of God. It is life or death that is set before Dr. Burke. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. So this is about somebody named Dr. Burke. But we can definitely see that this can apply to us. The Christian's warfare is not a warfare waged against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Christian must contend with supernatural forces, but he is not to be left alone to engage in the conflict. The Savior is the captain of his salvation, and with him, man may be more than conqueror. And of course, we would look at this as the battle against sin, not just externally, but also internally. But when it comes to this movement, Christ is our captain. He is our commander. He is our leader. And it's to him that we must uh, give obedience, not to man. The Christian life is a warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against the same uh, statement, same verse. In this conflict of righteousness against unrighteousness, we can be successful only by divine aid. Our finite will must be brought into submission to the will of the infinite. The human will must blend with the divine. This will bring the Holy Spirit to our aid, and every conquest will tend to the recovery of God's purchased possession, to the restoration of his image in the soul. And this is really our first work. And, and so often we assert our own will, our own views. We trust in our own opinions much more than we should. Trust in God and obedience to his will are as essential to the Christian in the spiritual warfare as to Gideon and Joshua in their battles with the Canaanites, Patriarchs and Prophets, 554. Instead of developing a character and enduring trial and bearing with courage and perseverance, they sink under the cloud, said the angel, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Jeremiah 12, 5. The time of trouble is before us, and if there is a lack of courage and ambition now, how will they pass the fearful scenes of that trying hour? Some make their lives almost useless by thinking they are more afflicted than they really are. The Lord calls for a reform. That's manuscript release of volume 15, 331. Through trials and persecution, the glory, character of God, is revealed in his chosen ones. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, 31. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Okay, so um, Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 31. So what's Exodus 15? What's that talking about? The Song of Moses. Yeah, that's the Song of Moses, right? Upon the crystal sea before the throne, that sea of glass, as it were, mingled with fire, so resplendent is it with the glory of God, are gathered the company that have gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. With the Lamb upon, with the lamb upon Mount Zion, having the harps of God, they stand the 144,000 that were redeemed from among men 
and there is heard as the sound of many waters and as the sound of a great thunder, the voice, the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne, a song which no man can learn, save the hundred and forty-four, forty and four thousand. It is the song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. None but the hundred and forty-four thousand can learn that song, for it is a song of their experience, an experience such as no other company have ever had. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These, having been translated from the earth from among the living, are counted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, Revelation 15, 2 to 3 and 14, 1 to 5. These are they which came out of great tribulation. They have passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments. But they have been delivered, for they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before God. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They have seen the earth wasted with famine and pestilence, the sun having power to scorch men with great heat. And they themselves have endured suffering, hunger, and thirst. But they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation 7, 14 to 17. In all ages, the Savior's chosen have been educated and disciplined in the school of trial. They walked in narrow paths on earth. They were purified in the furnace of affliction. For Jesus' sake, they endured opposition, hatred, calumny, calum, calumny, calumny. I never usually say that word out loud. They followed him through conflicts sore. They endured self-denial and experienced bitter disappointments. By their own pace, painful experience, they learned the evil of sin, its power, its guilt, its woe. They looked upon it with abhorrence, a sense of the infinite sacrifice made for it. Made for, uh, made for its cure, humbles them in their own sight and fills their hearts with gratitude of praise, which those who have never fallen can appreciate. They love much because they have been forgiven much. Having been partakers of Christ's sufferings, they are fitted to be partakers with him of his glory. So a very powerful statement there from the spirit of prophecy that we, we can know that we can endure because there's a goal that we are reaching. Nothing short of unreserved consecration to God will place us in such a relation to him that we'll, we will rightly perform every daily duty and cultivate a piety so thorough and practical as to make itself felt by all in the circle of our influence. We must guard ourselves against a love of self that will lead us to neglect, to render obedience to the important instructions Christ has given. These lessons should be so impressed upon our minds that we will consider how our words and actions appear to those who behold them. We should studiously cultivate Christian courtesy at all times which will keep us from neglecting that which is due to others. We must study the example Christ has left us as revealed in his character. And then all unconsciously to ourselves, we shall do the works he did. And I like how she says unconsciously to ourselves. Let heads of families look into their home life. Is this love exemplified in the family circle? Go farther in your self-examination. In your association with your brethren, in church capacity, do you find unkindness, selfishness, or even dishonesty? Be sure that you examine and prove yourselves, as Paul has directed. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. In the light of God's word, search carefully whether you truly have the love of God in the heart. 
This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. The love of Jesus needs to be brought to bear upon our lives. It will have a softening, subduing influence upon our hearts and characters. It will prompt us to forgive our brethren, even though they have done us injury. Divine love must flow from our hearts in gentle, gentle words and kindly actions to one another. The fruit of these good works will hang as rich clusters upon the vine of character. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Long-suffering is patience with offense, long-endurance. If you are long-suffering, you will not impart to others your supposed knowledge of your brother's mistakes and errors. You will seek to help and save him because he has been purchased with the blood of Christ. Tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he will hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. To be long-suffering is not to be gloomy and sad, sour and hard-hearted. It is to be exactly the opposite. There are church members who never feel sweet peace and rest in Jesus. They have made no growth in grace. They manifest no increase in meekness and love. An impatient, fault-finding, critical, envious, suspicious spirit classes them as yet among those under the influence of the, of the adversary of souls. If they would let the spirit of their savior come in, their cold, hard hearts would be melted and the merciful love of Jesus would be communicated to others instead of this worrying, exacting spirit. Christ followers are in this world for the purpose of working intelligently to pluck brands from the burning. A consistent religious life, holy conversation, a goodly example, godly example, true-hearted benevolence mark the representative of Christ. Every duty he will faithfully perform, thus becoming a beacon of light. Review and Herald, November 16th, 1886. Um, I'm just seeing what we got here. Um, this, as, as you can see, reading through this, this is extremely powerful counsel that we should all take to heart. And, you know, once again, it's, it's easy to look at others and see that other people need to hear this, but we need to hear it. Remember, Satan is never idle. He is filled with hatred against God and is constantly enticing men into a wrong course of action. Um, after the armies of the Lord have gained a signal victory, the great adversary is especially busy. He comes disguised as an angel of light, and as such, he endeavors to overthrow the work of God. Thus thoughts and plans were suggested to the mind of Gideon, by which Israel were led astray. The tribes on the east side of the Jordan were quite a distance from the tabernacle at Shiloh, uh, to which all the men of Israel were required to repair three times a year to attend great annual feasts. This, of course, required a considerable outlay of time and means. And, and you have to think back then to do this journey was, was not as simple as today. The thought was suggested to Gideon that it would be a great advantage to these tribes to have a place at home for sacrifice and worship. Without waiting for the divine sanction, he determined to provide a suitable place and to institute a system of worship similar to that carried out in the tabernacle at Shiloh. So it appears here that he's setting up a, a system of worship. As is natural, even at the present day, the people of Israel were more ready to ascribe the honor of the victory of Gideon, to Gideon than to the Lord. They readily complied with the request. Gideon led the people to look upon this ephod and the breastplate as possessing, possessing special sacredness in themselves. In this he erred. All that could make them sacred was the fact that they were employed in the solemn service of God as he had directed. The high priest alone was authorized to wear them when he went in before the Lord. Because he had been commanded to offer a sacrifice upon the rock, 
where the angel appeared to him. So this was a suggestion that uh, was made earlier in this study. Gideon concluded that he had been divinely appointed to officiate as a priest, and that by instituting a service there, he might save the people the trouble and expense of their journeys to Shiloh. The Lord was not pleased with this arrangement, for it was contrary to the order that he had established. It was an assumption of authority on the part of Gideon, which proved disastrous to himself and to all Israel. God designs that his people shall place a high estimate upon every provision for their salvation. He desires them to appreciate his great mercy and condescension, and to manifest gratitude and zeal proportionate to the value of the great gift of the Son of God. But we are disposed to shun sacrifice and self-denial for our eternal interest, while we readily devote time and strength to seek temporal advantage. Thus, our conduct too often shows that we place higher estimate upon earthly things than upon the heavenly treasure. So any comments on this so far regarding Gideon setting up um, um, this you know, alternate, I guess, uh, service of the Lord? Dwight, you have comments on this? In this situation. Well, it, go ahead, Dwight. Oh, go ahead, sister. Oh, I was just going to say, it does remind me of 1 Kings 12, where, where, where jo Jeroboam was envious of Judah and decided to set up his false church, as it were, in, in Dan and Beersheba. Mm -hmm. So this is what we need to be aware of and averse to because there's so many people, mainstream SDAs, for example, oh, well, the pastor says this, and, you know, the general conference says this, therefore we should be following this. And my, my retort is always, what does the word of God say? What is Ellen White's counsel? If it's contrary, then you go by what God has said, not by what man has said. And that's got me into big trouble. Okay. Thanks for that. Dwight? In these situations, God had ordained the worship in the tabernacle and then at the temple for the people to be able to bring to mind all that he had done for them. The problem that Gideon was having here is he was he was putting together something that was going to become a snare uh -huh. to all of those in that area, because at no time had our heavenly father ordained those from Manasseh, Ephraim, or even Judah mm -hmm. to becoming priests. I mean, he may have employed Levites in this. Case. Well, okay. But, we're not being shown this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And what, what's being said here, Gideon led the people to look upon the ephod and the breastplate in possessing special sacredness in themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, he may have, he have, may have created an ephod identical to that that was then in Shiloh. Mm -hmm. We're not told that either. No. But the one that was in Shiloh was to be worn by the high priest, and Gideon was not a high priest. Mm -hmm. We had the same situation or, or could see the same situation in history because by the time that Christ first walked on the earth, the position of the high priest was going up to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. This was no longer a situation as it had been ordained of God. Now we're in a situation for ourselves. The question is, whom will we serve? Are we going to serve a church, a, an organization itself, that is not completely 
following what God would have them to do? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to follow his word and his counsel as is revealed in the entirety of scripture that includes the spirit of prophecy? Well, this brings up a question you know, that I've had ever since I've been an Adventist and have recognized uh, that the church is not following the counsels in the spirit of prophecy. And I remember this would be, I think it would be 33 years ago. Um, we had uh, some twin sisters come and present at our church. I happened to be away that Sabbath, but I heard the report of what happened. Um, because the head elder, they were his niece, nieces, I guess. And so he invited them to speak. And they presented with a pile of Spirit of Prophecy books um, and all kinds of statements that the Adventist church had become Babylon and that we needed to leave the Adventist church if we were going to be saved. At least that's the report I heard of what they said. Um, so we know that there's this problem in the church. Now, this movement which Jeff Ray wrote, raised up, was meant to be a reform movement to reform Adventists, not the structure itself, but the people. And, and this movement went off track when we, uh, in 2017, you have Parminder, Tat, well, you don't have Tess, but you have Tabo uh, and, and Marco and, and other people pushing the idea that we need to have this new organization that's gonna call people out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And to me, that is the building of an ephod. That's what Gideon had been doing. And, and we saw Jeff get partially caught up in this. Uh, Parminder was very deceitful in how he, he placed Jeff upon a pedestal so that he could knock him down and take his place. I saw the same thing here with uh, with Mark Bruce, because he's the first one who really started to do this, to put Jeff as the prophet, uh, because Mark Bruce told, told me that he's going to be taking over Jeff's position when Jeff retires. So, so there was this, this idea that we needed this organization to replace what God had put up. But Christ had already set up an organization where each of us individually are to be connected with him. And so, you know, God has this system. So the way that I would look at this story is God has this system, this order, which here is in Shiloh. But in our time, where is our high priest? Is he in Shiloh? Is he in um, Washington, D.C.? Where is our high priest? He's in right. heaven. In heaven. Right. So that's the temple that we are to show our worship to, not to any man-made organization or structure. We are to be under Christ's leadership at this time. And, and so we can never make that mistake again. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't work in an organized fashion. It doesn't mean you don't have some kind of church order. You know, you don't just have, uh, you know, we, we have church order given to us in the spirit of prophecy and how we are to conduct our services and so forth. And also we know that we have to work together. We don't just have every man doing whatever he thinks to be right. We need to be able to counsel with our brethren and to take united action. But at the present time, we don't have that. And the question is, how are we going to work together? But, and that, that I don't have an answer to, other than that somehow, in the next few months, God is going to work upon our hearts in such a way that we're willing to work together. And I don't know how that happens, but I have to believe that God's going to work this out. <clears throat> And we have to wait mm -hmm. upon him. Mm -hmm. uh, patience comes in again. <laughs> yeah. The, you know, uh, the story. Yeah. Go on, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. The story of the Ephod reminds me of what, uh, how the Israelites uh, east of the, the Jordan 
they, they when they crossed uh, after they came back after taking the land that they set up an altar mm -hmm. and the, the tribes west of Jordan then were so outraged about this altar that they were very zealous they were going to have a war and they sent ambassadors and they found out it, it was it was not going to be an altar but here we have something sort of similar taking place and, and the tribes aren't really bothered about it this is maybe like maybe 100 years or so afterwards and to me it's reminding me a, a bit of what happened with uh, uh, Truman when he tried to have an ambassador sent uh, the United States to the Vatican but the Protestant churches in the 1950s kicked up about it yeah but then but then with Reagan in the 1980s it was like it didn't matter yeah okay so um so how do, how do you like you're dealing with that there how how do you look at the situation presently with this movement i mean i, I know what you're um, saying about that but as with the story of the Eastwood. yeah i mean i mean i've said what i think but i mean mm -hmm. I wonder what you think about it I'm not sure. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah that's sure. because because that's an interesting parallel you give there to that history. But I wonder about our history. I mean, unless you're just going to say we're going to look at it in that in that sense, dealing with the Protestant churches. Um, I just wonder if there's. I mean, we need this instruction from God's word. You know, all of these things that are in God's word, we can't ignore because they're going to give us guidance on what we are to do. You know, and I, I'm pretty persistent in what I think regarding, you know, July 18th, what's happened on December 6th and what's happening now and what our responsibility is. But I don't want to end up being rash at all either. In what I'm doing. Um, so, you know, right now we see in this movement, we see we got these uh, two, you know, every second Sabbath, so to, so to speak, we go between the United States Zoom and the Canadian Zoom. And, and they're quite different messages, as far as I can see. Now, maybe that's just my perception. Maybe, maybe I'm caught up in this emotionally or something. But I don't see that there is the unity in this movement. And the question is, how do we address that? What lessons can we learn from this, this story of Gideon and from our own recent past? Because, you know, we can look at what happened. And again, I've said this many times, December 6th is not just an example of them. It's an example of us. And, and really, we're not, we're not any better off now than we were on December 5th. Because remember December 5th, what happened on December 5th? Anybody remember oh, the Sabbath? It was uh, Dan Vanderhorst was presenting. His personal testimony. Yes. His personal testimony was censured. It was shut down. And thankfully I had the, the foresight to see that it was gonna be shut down and I quickly downloaded it and, and, and put it up on, on my website. Kelly Ross got blamed for that somehow, I'm not really sure. Um, but, um, but that was an extremely powerful testimony of how God was working in someone's life in this movement, but it wasn't welcome. But is that any different than what's happening now in this movement? Are we just as unwilling to listen to someone who has a different view on something? Are we willing to study together to find out what the truth is? Or, 
there, there's been a lot of reticence. Yeah, which I don't think there should be. We should be willingly and openly um, studying together and following the counsel that was given and that, that the Millerites who made the 1850 chart followed. They came together, they studied, even though there were differences, they allowed God to sort that out. And I don't know how we do that nowadays because we can't come together in the same place. But that's, yeah. also, that's also the situation that occurred with the disciples after Christ's return to right. the heavenly courts. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we're going to have to make use of what we have. And if that means that we have to examine for ourselves and then be able to address the issues that seem to be causing division, then we're going to have to be able to do it, whether we're going to use Zoom, whether we're going to have to use email, whether we're going to have to use whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I don't want to be rash in this, but when I look at the elephant in the room, you know, when we're on Zoom, I can't stand it because I don't like things that are stated. Um, differences of opinion that are stated, but that are, are placed in there in a, um, for lack of a better word, a passive aggressive type of way, right? Instead of being open, um, you know, people have different views and different opinions and they're slipped into a study, a sacred study, it's on Sabbath. And yet, you know, people are vying for position, maybe not positions of authority, but positions for their opinions, for their views. And, and I, I just believe that everything should be open. We should openly and honestly lay before God as a people the problems that we are having, the disagreements that, that exist within this movement, and study them in the spirit of Christ. And, you know, and I don't know how that's to happen, whether that's on Zoom, whether that's in private conversations, in smaller study groups. Uh, it definitely is not going to be like what happened with December 6, where you decided, okay, we're before that, back in October, you know, we're going to have a, a study on July 18th and decide, you know, what position we should take. And of course, it's already predetermined what the conclusion is, and everything's just a play act, but it's also done in a, a human authority way. It's not really an open way. It's not like, let's, let's look at everything. Let's lay out everything before God and ask God to show us what it is we are to do. And I don't believe that this movement is doing that. I'm trying to do it as an individual. Um, and I don't know if I can actually make other people do that. You know, I mean, they're going to have to decide to do that themselves. But I, I hate going to the studies personally, because we're not really talking about the problem that exists, that elephant in the room is being ignored. And I hate ignoring elephants. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. It's, it seems to me that we're talking about a process that Mrs. White has spoken of called the shaking. Mm -hmm. And it, the Spirit of the Lord can lead in that just as much as the devil. Yeah. Well, no doubt. Now, the thing is, when we look at our past history, and I can go back to 2014 when we had the first split. The problem from my perspective of understanding what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teaches is that people were not willingly or were not willing to follow the counsel that God had given. That if a bro brother differ with you, that you should take the time to understand his position fully and that you should allow uh, for the fact that you may be in error. So people were working behind the scenes, political maneuvering to get their 
position or their ideas to be the ones that are being accepted. And they, they were doing this over the, you know, the understanding of the book of Joel. But that wasn't really the real issue. The issue wasn't the understanding of the book of Joel. The issue had to do with, are we really converted or not? Are we willing to allow the truth to be what it is in spite of what I think? Are we allowed, allowing God to correct us, to correct this movement? And, and the, the vast majority then that left at that time were, or the group that left at that time, whether they're vast, I think they were the vast majority because there was all these other organizations. You just had FFA left at the end. And then we saw the same thing happen later on with Mark Bruce. We saw the same thing happen um, sort of as uh, uh, the result of what happened with Mark Bruce. There was a lot of other things happening. Um, and we saw this movement uh, continue to fracture. And then we had a type of unity that began to exist with Parminder and Tess, with Parminder in charge. But that unity was a unity that was of satanic origin. That is, the people who left this movement, the Omega, they had a type of organization, but it was with Parminder and Tess at the head and not Christ. But this movement then had uh, the, a mar marvelous manifestation of the power of God as far as I'm concerned, with July 18th. But then out of that apparent failure of that prediction, um, we had the majority leave us. FFA finally, in a sense, left the movement itself. And now here we are, this scattered flock, very parallel to what was happening in 1850. And the council that we had from uh, early writings, page 74, we see how this applies to our situation now. So the question is, are we going to continue to make the same mistakes as the past? Are we going to continue to uh, do political movering, different groups of people consolidating their friends and the people who agree with them and listening only to a certain group of arguments but not listening to what other people have to say. Are we gonna to continue to do that and continue to fracture this movement? Or are we going to follow the counsel that God has given? Learn the lessons of the story of Gideon. That, that to me is the real question. Okay, so I'm gonna read this here, uh, this paragraph because we're right near the end and I'm going to stop here. So it, it's asking us more a question almost, even though there isn't a question here. In seeking to bring the worship of God nearer home, and do we want to bring the worship, or worship of God nearer home? Is that a, a, a good thing to do in, in just a sort of metaphorical sense? Yes. Yes, okay. So what he was seeking to do, in a, in a sense, was not wrong. And we can apply it in a sense that is correct. But Gideon was but providing the indulgence of the people in their indolence. So here, he wasn't, he wasn't bringing them to an understanding of their true spiritual condition. This would have no beneficial influence upon them. All plans based upon human reasoning should be looked upon with a jealous eye, lest Satan insinuate himself into the position which belongs to God alone. And this is what has continually happened with this movement. Satan has insinuated himself in between us and God. The course pursued by Gideon proved a snare, not only to himself and family, but to all Israel. The irregular and unauthorized worship led the people finally to forsake the Lord altogether, to serve idols. The ephod and the breastplate were regarded with pride because of their costly material and exquisite workmanship. And after a time were looked upon with superstitious reverence. The services at the place of worship were celebrated with feasting and merriment 
and at last became a scene of dissipation and licentiousness. Thus, Israel were led away from God by the very man who had once overthrown their idolatry. And so this is something that, you know, we need to solemnly think of. So we're going to take this up. Um, the number of pages here, it's mostly, again, spirit of prophecy, but very powerful quotes. We got one, two pages, I think. So, um, so we'll, we'll finish this off. And, um, and then, so tomorrow morning. Um, and the next study that we have in notebook two is this study of Shebna's fate. So these are sort of individual studies. And whether we should look into these or not, I'm, I'm gonna to try to spend some time today to go through these. Um, and, you know, because uh, we have that one and then we have uh, fat, hard and heavy ears. So is these different studies. Um, and, and I think we probably should look at some of these uh, to finish off notebook two before we go into notebook three. And notebook three is extremely uh, pertinent, many of the things in there. Um, so, so that's the idea then for this week, maybe we can finish off notebook two and, and then next week, Lord willing, take up notebook three. I don't know if, that, if that's doable or not, but uh, I'll try to organize it a little bit so that we can get through some of these studies here that Jeff, Jeff has. Uh, any final comments before we close with prayer? I think we had discussed yesterday, or was it Friday or Thursday, the um, the weight of the amount of gold that was put into this ephod. So the seventeen hundred uh, um, shekels. Shekels. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so if, if we we thought well this is going to be too heavy for any priest to wear. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe it wasn't all used. Well, I, I'm not. Si you know, the possibility is that they didn't, um, even though they had that much gold, they weren't going to use all of that gold just in the ephod. Um, yes. So, but that's how much gold was collected. Um, yeah, because I don't think they could have built an ephod that that was that heavy. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be practical. And Ellen White does say that they set up a, a system of worship with somebody wearing that ephod. She doesn't say who. Uh, definitely wasn't Gideon uh, doing this, at least I'm pretty sure it wasn't. And, and the thing that's weird, though, here is that you have this in response to, um, you know, people wanting Gideon to rule over them. And he says, I'm not going to. Neither are my sons going to rule over you. Um, but he does this as a response to that. So he says, well, give me your gold. and I'm going to make this 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 ephod. Right. Um, and, and then he sets up this system of worship there in Oprah so that people are going to Oprah instead of Shiloh. Um, I mean, that wasn't really clear to me until I read this stuff this morning during the study of what Ellen White says. So I hadn't looked into that before. Um, even though I'd skimmed over it, I didn't, didn't really notice that. So, um, you know, so we have to believe that this is what, what happened, but, um, yeah, I, there's still lots of little pieces of information. Elder White feels, gives us more pieces of information than we get from the story itself. Um, now, um, now, Dwight, are you going to next Sunday afternoon present with chapter nine of, uh, or do you know for sure that you can do that? I worked on chapter nine and yeah. led to work on that yesterday. Yeah. Okay. And it's actually come together much faster than I thought it would. Okay. Now it's a question as to how, how you'd like to see this done and how others would like to see this done, because a lot of this ties very directly in with what we're addressing right now with Gideon. Okay. I mean, 
for this Sunday afternoon, I was planning to to kind of look at what I was doing Friday night. Which and, I think is a good idea. Yeah, and go over the, um, uh, the MOLAD interval a little bit and just show what we were doing so that people can understand it. Right. So to kind of explain what it what this calculator was doing. And, you know, because we just sort of threw this stuff up, stuff up in front of people, obviously they had no understanding uh, of what we were doing. So I was trying, figuring that I could do a, a sort of a, a more concise study on that this afternoon. And, and you think that's when we should do that? I mean, I could do that Friday nights if you wanted to take today. No, I, I mean, I think, I think that the, the understanding of this with the MOLAD is going to be very important. Okay. Now there's there's several things that when I started going through this in depth regarding Judges 9, there are some things here that are really making me shake my head. So there's quite a bit, I think, that, that's going to have to be unpacked on this particular chapter that is going to have relevance for what we've been discussing today. Yeah. Well, you know, another option we have, I mean, we could, we could take that study up on them in the mornings as well. I mean, we could do judges chapter nine in the mornings and, you know, and finish that off before we go into finish off notebook two and, and that, I mean, that's another possibility. Right. And, what, I, what I'm going to try to do is to get as much of this ready so I can send it to have it reviewed quickly to see what, um, what our thoughts would be. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because we got lots of things we got to study and how we want to approach this. Now, how much material, how, mu how long do you think it would take you to go through and present uh, Judges 9? Two to three days. So two to three days. So far, just just in unpacking what I have, what I've been led to do just from scripture. I now have 12 pages. Okay. And what I have found in Spirit of Prophecy is probably going to take that closer to 16 pages. Okay. So you're okay with doing it just on Sundays? It'll take then maybe a month to get through. By the end of September, you'll be done the study. Is that I, seem... you know? I'm I'm going to leave that. I'll leave that open. I mean, whether we want to do it in the mornings, whether we want to do it on Sunday afternoon, we'll just we'll address it and go from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, leave that open, I guess, because <clears throat> I mean, an option is to to uh, to bring it to to the morning studies this week right maybe not um tomorrow but maybe uh tuesday, tuesday wednesday thursday. thursday and see what we do with it yeah okay so i'll keep that kind of open but today i'll do the study at 1 30 mountain daylight time okay um dealing with the mola trying to give this study of what it was that i was doing and what i've seen as i've worked through this uh I'm a little slow sometimes when it comes to understanding things because I'm just very methodical. And, and sometimes the things that are right under my nose, I don't notice. And uh, so there are things there that, that I've seen uh, that really helps us understand um, these, these calendars and how we can apply them as prophetic calendars. But one of the things has to do with this the Islamic calendar and the relationship of um, what we call the lunar year to the prophetic year and, and why this is significant. So this to me was kind of an eye opener yesterday when I was studying this, uh, that I, I just didn't notice something so very obvious, which maybe other people would notice if they thought about it much more readily than me. But OK, so that's where we're ending today. Um, for this morning. So we got to study this afternoon. Tomorrow, then we will take up these uh, um, 
the end of this, we'll see what we, we can do tomorrow on looking at notebook two. So, so I'm gonna have to spend some time before tomorrow morning deciding what we're gonna do um, and figure this out. But anyway, thanks for the study. Let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your instruction, for the way that you correct us when we're wrong, and for the way that you have, have prepared a way before us, that your light is always there whenever we need it. We give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask for forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, for this movement that you can bring about the order and unity that, uh, that you need to have in order to accomplish this work upon the earth. Help us to trust in you um, and to do the things that you ask us to do each day. May your angels watch over each one and uh, be with us in the study this afternoon as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.